I was 10, 11, 12, I don't remember, in line for the movies. And my, there were two guys in line in front of us, like three or four people in front of us holding hands. And my mother pulled me to her, not my siblings, just me, and looked at my father and said, they're weird. Which just made me look at those guys and I went, oh, now I get it. I'm weird like they're weird. And, and I looked at them and I thought, they look happy, they look like they're in love. Um, I'll be fine. Inform brings you incredible stories. I left two days before the revolution. It killed me so hard. James has never experienced the taste of fruits that haven't been attacked by pesticides, just like he's never experienced a neighborhood that hasn't been attacked by bullets. Some things just go hand in hand. People say what's on their mind. I think that it is a, um, a cardinal sin to lie to the American people um, about war. Partisanship is a version of narcissism. In downtown San Francisco, the Commonwealth Clubs and Forum curates events that bring you face to face with the world's changemakers. One third of the wage gains that women have made since the 1960s were made as a result of the birth control pill. Twitter is a technology that I don't think we've seen before in this world. Since 1903, the most innovative leaders have come to the Commonwealth Club to share their vision. Sharing cars, sharing their homes, sharing, sharing a shared dream, a shareable American dream. That could work. You each can play a role in helping us chart a better future. Housing and health and education and policy all live close to the surface in us when our children are murdered. It's all the same story. We bring together the visionaries shaping the emerging trends in technology. It was a combination of instant and telegram. It was the idea that you could take a moment in time and you could capture it and you could just send it out and broadcast it with the entire world. I just threw the site together in about a week when I was at school. Oh, great. We've got angels, we've got incubators, we've got accelerators, we've got seed funds, we've got crowdfunding. We eat, we drink. <laughs> One of our first dates ever, we pickled like 100 pounds of herring and made 300 Definitely pounds of nerds. sauerkraut. Wow. Yay! We never shy away. 75% of the people of this country want universal health care and expect it. And damn it, let's go. Concentrated, deep, slow, loving, tender, passionate sex. Whether you want to be on the cusp of current events or feast on pop culture. I should have a great time writing it. I should write a book that is as fun as any party I'd be skipping. Inform events are fun and action-packed. I have a sh an anthropology scarf that does that <laughs> twisty thing, so. Come feed your mind and soul and celebrate the future with Inform. I love San Francisco, and every time I come back here, I remember that this is the only city in America that has magic. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's virtual program with Inforum. I'm DJ Patil, data scientist and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. I'm honored to be in conversation today with Alexis Madrigal, a reporter for The Atlantic. A year ago, Alexis helped launch the volunteer organization, the COVID Tracking Project. His goal was to fill the gaps of what was, at that time, unknown territory and to collect and publish the data required to understand the COVID-19 outbreak here in the United States. Now, we're a year later, and with a new administration in the White House, Alexis and his colleagues have decided to wrap the project up. We're here to discuss all that Alexis has learned in that year of data, working with different people, policymakers, and what he thinks next is going to happen for all of us. Please remember to place any questions you have for Alexis in the chat or comment section of the live stream you're watching. And just before we get started, I just want to mention you can follow Inforum here at the Commonwealth Club, uh, Club at, on social media uh, for Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for Inforum. It's at Inforum SF. And for the Commonwealth Club on Twitter, it's at CW Club on Twitter and the Commonwealth Club on uh, Facebook. And of course, you can follow Alexis at, at Alexis Madrigal, his first name, last name at Twitter, and I'm Deepatil at Twitter, where you can also send things. But hopefully you will have a lively chat because there is so much to talk about <laughs> a year 
that has happened. It feels both, it feels short and fast and crazy. And, you know, maybe I just want to start by saying uh, first, my appreciation, thanks for everything that you and the incredible team of volunteers that came together to do around the COVID tracking project. And maybe just to take us all back a year ago, the only data we really had about COVID was the data off of two cruise ships. Those of us that were calling or talking to friends who were ER physicians in, in Northern Italy and a little bit of the data that was being reported out of China. And so maybe take us back to that, that moment, you as a reporter and talking about these, how did this start? What was, what was the spark? Yeah. Well, it, it's really two things. One was that I was reading the blog of a genomic epidemiologist named Trevor Bedford up in Seattle, um, who in doing sort of genomic analysis uh, of the, of those genomes that were available in sort of international repositories had realized based on sort of doing the family trees of these viruses, that it was probably everywhere already. This is a, you know, in mid and late February, Trevor's posting these things actually now on the advisory board of COVID tracking project. Um, and back then I remember the exact moment. Uh, this is so San Francisco. So I'll share the story. I was like sitting on my yoga mat and I get this text message having just, I'm in Shavasana trying to stay calm during the, uh, during the pandemic. I get this text message from Rob Meyer, who actually uh, a guy hired out of college and who's only worked at the Atlantic. Um, he's a, he's normally a climate reporter, but he'd been following um, COVID really closely as well. And Rob sa- has had sent a link to this blog post by Trevor Bedford in which he laid out all these things. And I just remember that as being sort of my last normal moment um, and in the week after that, um, Rob and I realized we started looking into, well, how many, you know, it doesn't seem like there's that many cases in the U S you know, we're talking dozens of cases, like what's going on is, you know, again, late February, very early March. And, you know, we seem to be trying to test people, you know, um, the administration at that point was talking about, you know, testing tens of thousands of people and even throwing around numbers that were in the millions, um, to kind of try and distract from the on the ground reality. So finally on March 4th, um, Rob and I sat down and said like, well, what are we going to do here? And we went to every state website and we called, uh, every, uh, called and emailed every um, state health department to ask them two questions. How many people have you tested and how many people can you test? And what we got back from that was totally terrifying. Um, you know, as of the morning of March 6th, fewer than 2000 people had been tested in the entire United States. At that point, we had tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of cases in the US, we now know. Um, we also found that many states only had the capacity to test like two or three people. I remember that hearing back from the Arkansas people. I was like, yeah, you know, we can test about two people a day, maybe three if we push it. <laughs> you know, um, this is like right before this tidal wave uh, is about. Yeah, to CDC start. didn't even have the tests approved. We didn't have. Yeah, CDC watched this test, eight, and that's... then there was a whole thing with the FDA, where essentially the FDA said to other laboratories and, and universities that would otherwise have been able to develop the test, technically, they said, no, you can't, you got to wait for the CDC test. Then finally, on February 29th, they approved these other, it was leap year, they, they approved these other um, places to start developing tests. And then finally, we start to get some testing. But even with all that, we had fewer than 2,000 confirmed tests on, on March 6th. And for the whole place. United States. For the whole population. United States. Yeah, 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 almost yeah, 300 million. million. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, within a couple of weeks, that many people were dying a day. Wow. Yeah, and, you know, at that point in time where you, you know, you're, you're, you're approaching this from uh, as a reporter, you're calling these people. Are they taking your call or are they just pointing you to a website? Like, how, how did this work? It was a mix. I think in that first round, we were able to get to about 20 or 25, like actual live contacts with um, states. And then what happened was right after we published that story, a guy named Jeff Hammerbacher, who's a mutual friend of ours, I've known him since I was you know, 18 years old, freshman in college, uh, who later went on to work at Facebook and build data systems there. And then eventually went into bioinformatics, even though like when we were in college, he was a sort of math genius baseball player doing applied math. Um, he sent me an email saying like, hey, did you use our spreadsheet? 
And I was like, your spreadsheet. And it turned out that of the, all the people in this whole country who could have been doing this thing, which was compiling this information from States, it was me, there was Rob and there was Jeff Hammerbacher. Um, so <laughs> within the next day, Jeff uh, and Rob and I had pulled in Aaron Kassane, who had worked for Mozilla managing these kind of large open news projects. Uh, and we'd made a call for volunteers and we were kind of off and, off and running. Mm -hmm. And at that point, we started to, to answer your question more directly, we, we then added a woman named Kara Oler, who was a reporter, done a bunch of stuff for This American Life and, and other areas. And we started like building this outreach team to, to talk to states to help them, you know, really to help understand the data that was going on their dashboards. Um, and, you know, we didn't think we were going to do this forever. <laughs> we just thought this was going to be like, okay, we'll do this for two or three weeks. The CDC will show up. And then like, we can just have been like, okay, we won. We shamed them into publishing these testing numbers. Um, and it was only later that we realized that they actually just didn't have the numbers. Mm -hmm. Maybe like one of the, there's so many dimensions here that I'm, I'm excited to talk about. One, maybe the first is, Talk us through what prevented good numbers from actually happening. And, and what I'm really asking here, I think, is what we all want is what should we be doing also next time around to ensure that this shouldn't happen again? Is it a county to state issue? Is it the federal government? Like, like there's these pipes of, of infrastructure that are supposed to be working, but they didn't. And, and where, was, where were they gummed up? Yeah, I mean, I, well, I definitely want to hear your answer to this question as well. Um, from our perspective, um, there were a few different things that were going on. Uh, one is really long term, zoom way out and say like, well, why wasn't this already in place? You know, people have been thinking about having this, you know, electronic laboratory reporting, which is really what a lot of what we're talking about in, that we were doing in the early days, you know, tests and cases and things like this. People have been talking about being able to do this in a fully electronic way for 15 years. So you see, if you go to their website, they'll talk about how they've been working on this kind of data modernization of electronic laboratory reporting for 15 years. Um, but in, in the American system, this is pretty complicated, right? We've got all the jurisdictions. So that means like the states... And then the states have like a particular contract and relationship with the federal government. And then there's the counties, which then have a, a kind of similar, actually kind of push pull relationship with the state. And so you need every, the, your data quality at a national level is actually dependent on your data quality at the county level. And that means not just, you know, different ideological positions of those people within the counties, particularly around a politicized issue like COVID, but it also means different technical capabilities at, at all of those places. And so what really built up was a kind of sedimentary kind of system where you had like every layer of technology by which you could transmit information was still a way that you could transmit information. So like you had, you know, at the top, you had like HL7, you know, this like sort of standard and format for moving health information around. But then you also had fax machines, you know, you had faxes going back and forth. And so, you know, we've all become familiar with the backlog, right? Like that, that suddenly you just see a state reports a bunch of deaths or a bunch of tests or a bunch of cases. And a lot of the reason that happens is the bulk of things are now transmitted electronically. But someone eventually looks over at the desk in the corner and goes, hey, what are all those papers? And they walk over there and they go, oh, Jesus. It's 10,000 test uh, results that were an input into the system. Somebody puts them in the system and then eventually it shows up on the dashboard. So there's, that's our understanding of the problem as it has developed through time was both like that really deep, long problem. And then on a specific level, it was very difficult to just like build emergency systems quickly. Um, but for those who don't know, you worked on the California data systems for months. So like, is that your understanding of how, it also went, or did you see like a different set of problems from like your vantage point in the system? You know, it's, it's actually one of these fascinating things because we're, we were working, we're all working on COVID this time last year, working on different parts. I, you know, I, I was up in the California trying to figure out what was going on for up in Sacramento. And I think one of the things that you pointed out is like, who actually is, owns this data at the end? Like who has the data? And some of that's sitting in a lab, like that's testing things. It could be at a university. It could be at a lab core. Um, it could be at Quest, one of these facilities. Or it's just sitting in somebody's filing cabinet. It's like a piece of paper. It's, it's no one's actually digitized it. And then how do you actually move that data up? 
And, and, and what I mean up is like up the hierarchy, if you will, from county or a hospital up to the county level, up to the state, over to the CDC. How do you ensure quality control? And some of the things that we found was just basic reporting. You know, people were submitting these things. And sometimes there was a lot of people who would fill in the, 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 the virtual spreadsheet multiple times a day. And so you got this massive overaccount. You got all this backlog. And so it's almost like we never tried these systems. Like we, we, it's like a plumbing system that you finally decided to turn on because it's an emergency, but not you, recommended. Yeah. yeah not recommended. Like it's not like, this isn't the way to operate. And to me, it finally comes, comes back down to, to that. We, we haven't invested in this for almost 40 years. And, 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 and it's definitely the last 10 years has been a massive gap in, in, in this. And so like one of the things that fascinates me about the, the, the efforts that you provided is not only were you able to get this team together, you, you became the, uh, the gold standard. You became the gold standard for data. I mean, when I open up in the morning, I'm like, what's going on? I'm looking at the state reports. I'm looking at the county reports. I got a bunch of other data that's being sent to me. But I'm really looking at your data because you put the QA, the quality assurances, the quality practices in place. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, like, how did you, there's almost this thing of like, this is what we expect government to do, but you did it so fast with such agility. What, what was that like running this? Well, um, I mean, it certainly was one of those day. I mean, if there's any startup people, I've actually never been in a startup, <laughs> but I think that I think you're well of, qualified. Yeah. It? Yeah. That, that feeling of being, um, you know, in the little nose cone of the rocket ship certainly is what it felt like to me. Um, we had so much, uh, intellectual firepower come to, uh, to the project. I mean, people really, really wanted to help. And it, it was actually quite interesting because they came from very different places. Um, there were some tech people, but there were a lot of other people who just were good with data, had worked with it in some capacity. We had, you know, one of our very early and very good data quality people um, was actually a small business person and his business was running weed shops in Colorado. Um, but you know, there's a lot of data that's flowing through and you want that data to be high quality. And he, um, he really got that process going along with Jeff Hammerbacher. But you know, when, what really started to change our overall operation from a data quality perspective was, it was two, two women, one named uh, Michal Mart, um, who'd been working and she'd worked for her brother's startup. She was like a, a coder and data person and Kara Sheckman, who actually put off um, entering a graduate program at Stanford in sort of like AI and ethics um, to, to stick with us. And Michal kind of lined out here are the different areas that are required for us to increase our data quality. You know, so it was basically like we'd been doing state notes for a long time, but we needed to be much more structured and systematic about it. Okay. We'd been doing backfills. Okay. We need to make sure that all of these things are documented. We need to do this set of research projects in order to understand all the differences in all this data. And Kara came in with just like, just this, I mean, there's a ton of smart people on this project and people are all like, Whoa, she's smart. <laughs> like it was just like, she was just really grasped in total whole data systems and had incredible intuition about where we needed to do more research to understand problems. And so I'll give you just an example of what this looks like. So right now there's federal testing data and there's data that the States put out the data that the States put out can come from a different place in the system. So let's say that there's data coming in over here. There's a bunch of stuff that happens and the state will actually output it over here because they want the best quality data because their governor is their boss and they're going to get in trouble if they don't have good data on the dashboard, right? But they also need to send some data to the CDC. So what's the easiest thing to do here? You just take the sort of more raw stream and you cut, you cut a little tributary over to the CDC and you just kind of set it and forget it. And that might work fine at first, but what Kara's intuition said and what has turned out to be the case is that that feed does not get continuously validated. So over time, the number of tests that a state presents and the number of states that the feds know about, uh, a gap grows between those two things. And so it's that kind of research and QA sort of intuition that has allowed us to uh, both improve our, our, the data that we compiled from states 
you know, which we call our data, but it's not really, it's compiled from the States. And, and also to sort of lens into how these federal systems work. And I just want to say like, these things may sound like they're, they're just sort of technical in nature and maybe don't like change things on a, on an actual like uh, operational level. But if you think about those things like positivity rate, so what are the two components of positivity rate? One is cases and you know positive tests. The other is that it's the denominator. It's the total tests that are done, right? So if your state has one denominator and the feds have another denominator, that's actually a pretty big problem. And we actually saw that this could, you know, around, particularly when a state was near a threshold, like 5% positive, which a lot of states used um, to, to do various things, it could easily move you above or below that some of these uh, data quality issues. And so these things are real operational problems um, and they, they really didn't get <laughs> solved very effectively for a long time. Well, given that, like, you know, these, they, 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 everyone is pinning things around case positivity and, and so much was riding on shelter in place, not sheltering in place. You know, like at one point, California had a massive backlog that was sitting just due to some technical issues that was, it was sort of the data was backed up and constipated, if you will. But then you also had these claims of data being misused uh, in, in uh, Florida in Georgia and other places, the way they were being shown. Walk us through what some of those late night discussions are, as I imagine they were quite, quite contentious as you're trying to interact with the states or they're looking at your dashboard and saying, you're wrong, COVID tracking project. And you're saying, no, no, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> take, take <laughs> or in, actually, uh, you're right. Sometimes we say, <laughs> yeah, like, take, take us into that. How did that go? Yeah. Yeah, that was really, I mean, by far the most stressful part of the project was interacting with the states. Um, really what happened, I mean, to be honest, what happened was our data became accepted as the standard, particularly around things like tests and hospitalizations. And because of that, um, it was used by all kinds of entities, including huge dashboards like Johns Hopkins and New York Times. So when a state would go to track down where a particular set of numbers came from, um, they all roads led back to the COVID tracking project. And we did not always want the numbers to be used to do things. Like we don't actually think it's a good idea from the outside to calculate positivity rate for a bunch of reasons that are hard to describe in a forum like this, but just, just stuff is to say, use the state's positivity rate because they know the little wrinkles in their dashboard. Um, nonetheless, testing volume is important. We felt like it's important to put these numbers out. So, um, we developed over time, I, I would say like quite good relationships with almost every state that we worked with. And I, I would say over time, probably, you know, 30 or 40 states, we ended up really having like real interactions with. Um, we, and I think part of it was we had a pretty simple mantra, like we want to get this right. If we're not getting it right, then help us get it right. Mm -hmm. Usually what that meant was release more data. And we, always maintained in the project that we could not put any data onto the COVID tracking project website or into the API that wasn't public. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the public data allows all the journalists to work with it and, and check on it. This turned out to be really important in places like Florida and Georgia. And we saw ourselves as kind of a, a node in this network, possibly the central node in certain kinds of networks. But we worked a lot with local journalists to say, hey, you might want to take a look at this. Seems like something weird is going on here. And that allowed us to sort of work with states as well as journalists to sort of produce um, more and more data. Um, we basically shook free, I would say maybe three dozen data sets out of states, meaning like time series. And that's like a win for everybody in that state. You know, it doesn't matter if they came to the COVID tracking project site. Now it was on the dashboard for the, uh, for the state. And I think the states came to see us as uh, people who would work and do whatever it took to get the numbers as, as close as possible to what was going on there in their dashboards and in their internal systems. And that um, we would also try to keep people from doing things that were a bad idea. And so, you know, we had some really tough conversations with uh, Massachusetts over the summertime 
because they didn't like the way that we were doing a couple of things. And they're probably right about that, but it was kind of the best that we could do at the time. And I think that they realized that over time we would just work to improve it. And they worked with us and they turned out to be one of our best relationships. And they're really an amazing um, state public health department. Um, I think the only time we ever got torched was by the governor of North Dakota. Uh, he was just mad at us. And we've been working with his people for literally weeks, literally weeks. And we're like a day away from deploying the fix. He has a news conference and just unloads on us. And so we got, we emailed the guys, we go like, really one day away, you know, but even then we still worked with the state. We still fixed it. You know, we did our best to try and we knew that they're under incredible pressure, especially state public health departments, man, those people are, are truly heroes and have worked so hard no matter what their political affiliation was. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and, and on the politics side, you know, the white house has a press conference and suddenly they're putting up your <laughs> dashboards. What, what, what was that moment like where you suddenly go, wait a second, the white house is using our data, not CDC. Yeah. I mean, <sighs> We kind of knew that they didn't have we, we knew that the feds didn't have a time series for test for tests um, that which means time series means, you know, every day going back through time, you say this is how many tests there were and they wanted to show how many tests there were in time series. And so, of course, they started to use some of the data. Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burks, we you know, we now know that they were users of the site and, and fans. Um, But, you know, back when we first started to see that stuff, honestly, like I want to say that we were like thought it was so great and cool. We were just crushed. I mean, it's like. It's satisfying to do something like this that's of like national importance, like obviously, you know, when the worst times come, you want to think that you would step up and do as much as you could. But like we were people were dying, you know, (laughs) I mean, like and just felt like the government was particularly the federal government was at war with itself at war with the States, um, you know, had made, as we noted earlier, had not made the investments necessary to have a good COVID data system. And despite all that, we're pretending like the data was good. I mean, one of the most frustrating things about all of this was the idea that we were actually making data driven decisions based on, you know, and that's why you got all these like thresholds and, you know, these like very precise stoplights and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And at the same time, we were inside the data and knew that it was not good enough to make those kinds of precise decisions. I mean, we we basically pretended we were Singapore. We're like, oh yeah, we have all the data. We know all the stuff. And you could put charts together and you can make it look like that. But like, we actually didn't have all the data. And we, we knew that the data quality was low across a, a variety of metrics, not just tests, but also in hospitalizations and even in deaths. Um, and so for us, it was very hard. And I, and I think that, you know, particularly my co-lead in this through, throughout Aaron Kassane, she would take it really hard. I, I, I think at a certain point I was just like, I've stopped expecting anything. And I think like, um, I, I think it was really, it was really tough. Some of our people would be crushed by it for sure. Were you able to talk to the white house, white house, Alexis? Um, was able to talk to the white house. Uh, how can I answer this? Not really. Um, we were able to talk with some folks on the coronavirus task force. So I guess in a sense, but we had no contact with any of the political figures at the, at the white house. Um, Mm. our best, I mean, this is a, this is public now. So I think we can talk about this. Our best contact was, um, a woman named Amy Gleason who came over from us digital service, which was, you know, founded, I mean, this is amazing. If there's any tech people listening out there, get into, get yourselves in the us digital service, um, Obama era, um, you know, kind of real, real diamond of that, of that administration, a way of getting like technical talent into the, the federal government to solve specific problems. And she was put in charge of building hospitalization data system inside HHS, which a lot of people heard about as a bad thing, but was in fact a really good thing. Um, and we started to talk with her and she was able to provide some visibility into things that were going on with the data systems there, um, which then allowed us to begin to do the kind of analysis that we wanted to do, um, comparing uh, federal and state compiled data. Um, and eventually what we were able to show is that for cases, deaths and hospitalizations, things look pretty good, um, which is you know not to go too far down the line and anticipating your questions, but is one of the reasons why we feel like we can wrap up um, the, the data 
collection portion of our project. Well, it's, it's one of these things I've like, if you were a startup, you would have said, Hey, what's next. And you could have said, Hey, we're going to get into modeling or we're going to get into vaccines or mm-hmm. these other approaches. Why, why kind of hold the line at just testing versus kind of going into these other dimensions that we're starting to see. And uh, well, let me leave it there. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, there's kind of a deep answer to this and there's like a less deep answer to this. I think the really deep answer though, is the reason we were effective as a totally de novo entity made up of people who hadn't done this stuff before and were just doing the work was our institution could be just 100, like all of the energy of the institution, just, it was one arrow, fix this problem, do this thing. There were no other institutional things that came into play. We didn't have to build a long-term model. We didn't have to have like a, a official W2 employees. You know, the Atlantic gave me incredible room to run, to do this stuff You know, we had foundations that came in with support, so we had money to do things. But all of it was fixated on just actually doing the thing and not holding anything back for the organization or the institution. We could just burn it all. Just just, just all the fuel would get burnt. We realized like in November of last year that if we were really going to, and believe me, tons of people talk to us about doing vaccinations and all kinds of other data collection. Um, We realized that if we were going to go down that road, we could no longer be a central node and a network that pushed all the value to the edge. We would have to start capturing a lot more value for ourselves um, in one way or another, because we'd have to become a self-sustaining institution that could offer people stable employment that could um, have like an actual legal entity called the COVID tracking project, which does not exist. It's just a thing. Um, And all of those things seems like really big problems to me because from my perspective, one of the huge, huge issues throughout this entire pandemic is all these institutions out for themselves, CDC out for themselves. I I, I hate to say that, but they, one of the biggest issues in this has been CDC has wanted to control as much as they could, even if they're not the best place to do certain things, even if other agencies within HHS need to do some components. You know, we've seen that with certain universities that kind of went to COVID as a business model, you know, and now they, they've got to capture stuff for themselves in that way. So some other civil society orgs like ourselves out for themselves. And I just, I, I was so proud of the fact we didn't do that. And that we really did just try and like deliver it to deliver to other people, be in service to this, to the country that the idea of like having to like go raise $5 million and make this thing something that would go for some years. I hated that idea. I really did. Like, I I just thought that it would, um, that's not where I wanted the org to go. Sometimes you need to know it to stop, you know, we did a thing and we did it well and now the feds can pick it up and let's just say, you know, that's what it was, emergency response org. And, and now some other folks have showed up. Well, let's tackle it, maybe break this into a couple of parts. The first part, I think, which is there is this incredible rise of the citizen scientists. This, this group that came together, I suspect most of you have never met because this all happened during nope. COVID. <laughs> now everyone talks about remote work or all these things. Yet you're, here you are solving, going from zero to, to everything, becoming the gold standard for everybody on this, uh, uh, the, the, the traffic to the site, all these pieces and the hard conversations. And, and so you showed that there's a different, a new model out there. This is a new model by which people can be, can take their skills and apply them and lead from the front. And, and I'm curious, maybe first on this part, which is, and maybe this starts even with you, you know, you're an English major, <laughs> You know, you're, you're, how did you, like, how does an English major who's working at the Atlantic almost get this passion for data? Like we've all become armchair data scientists, <laughs> epidemiologists in some sense, but you were kind of at the front of this. What, what is it about you as Alexis that decided to be like, okay, I'm got to, I've got to be a data scientist now. Oh man. Well, you always won. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, I, I've done plenty of, stories that, it, that incorporated lots of data. 
But, you know, the real magic of this thing is not Alexis. It's that it's the community that came around it. Like if there's anything I feel like that was unique about my background and skill set that that was, you know, dispositive for this thing being successful, it was really about community building and about being someone who'd been on the Internet for a really long time. Aaron Kassane, co-lead in this, had been on the Internet for we're like OG Internet people. You know, we've been on since we were children and we have been involved in building communities and and um, and knowing how to communicate with people in this fully virtual environment for a long time. And so what really we really did was build the community, which really had that productive capacity, because the truth is like, I'm not, it's totally right. I'm not a data scientist, you know, like, don't, don't put me into that. I, you know, I, I can't, I, I would not want to, pl- I would be playing. Too so bad. We've, you're, you're, you're part of the tribe now. <laughs> I mean, you, you, like, you've got the shirt to match, man. Like yeah, you're yeah. officially a data scientist. <laughs> I, I think that what I, what I will say is that we fully immersed ourselves in this community and in this data so that a lot of us developed good intuition for where the data was going. And that allowed us to say a lot of things like we were, we were really swimming in it in a certain way. And there's really only one other data set that I've ever had that feeling with, which was this uh, hilariously, I wrote a story with another colleague of mine, Ian Bogus about Netflix uh, micro genres. We realized that they were storing every micro genre sequentially on their website. So we just wrote a little scraper that walked through them all like, you know, eighties Canadian comedies or whatever. Um, And I knew everything about how that data worked and how, how it was put together. Um, and, and I think that that kind of immersion in the data, which our entire team did and which sort of, because it was this community that was all processing it, you had people, you know, there's a guy named Dave Lowe who actually has done a ton of work, you know, he's an MD uh, and he has done a ton of work with with healthcare data. We had public health specialists uh, in communications like Jessica Milati Rivera or Rebecca Glassman, who's another MPH. We had a bunch of people who were used to working with data. So it was basically like the sum was greater than the parts. And I think that if there is a lesson for future emergencies, I actually think a group like this can be reformed and would be extremely effective. I mean, I don't, I don't just mean our group. But I think that it takes like a real ethic of care and gratitude with people. Like that's what, that what, what we really had was sort of an ethic of care for each other because people are doing this extremely difficult work, like emotionally difficult work under trying personal circumstances for many of them in life. And because it was, there were tons of volunteers in addition to paid staff that were involved, we really developed this kind of culture of gratitude that this really like very specific thank yous to people for things that they were doing. And I think that's the only way that you can actually make like a citizen science project like this work. It's, it's not a job in that way. It's not about the money. It's about like the, the mission and it's about the culture of the project and community. And like that part of it is like, it honestly makes you a little emotional because it's like, it is so strong. Like that culture in there is, you know, people like, for example, Slack, like people add emoji to the Slack, right? There are probably, I don't know, 1500 custom emoji. I'd say 300 of them are variations on the COVID tracking project logo. There's a whole merch store, there's stickers, there's, and that's really, you know, even though that's not the work, the work gets produced by a community that needs that other stuff, that needs that cultural component to feel part of the mission. And I think um, there's, there's a lot of lessons right. in that. And we're, ho- we're hoping to write some of them up. We just haven't. Really I hope you chance. do, because I, yeah. maybe just a couple of reflections here that I think you're calling out that I think are just important is, you, th- you hear startups and companies always talking about mission and passion and sense of urgency. And you, you know, you brought a team together and, and, and uh, it had all of it. It's like the envy of what everybody in business world wants to have. And, 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 the, and the second part of it is, is and I, hopefully people out there who are listening have caught this is like, you're giving names to all the people who did work. And so you are truly, as we say in data science, like data science is a team sport and, yeah. and you're making sure to give the names. Apologies, there's a little construction going on. So, but, but you're really giving the names to everybody. 
I mean, there, they, this community, I mean, I, it's hard to describe, but, um, you know, there's, there's some amazing San Francisco journalism uh, about this very topic. I mean, Rebecca Solnit wrote this thing called A Paradise Built in Hell, which I, I read years ago. It's really about, you know, how actually after disasters, people think like chaos and terror breaks out. But that's actually not true at all. That actually after disasters, communities come together and provide aid for themselves. And I think that's what this is. I think that, you know, I, I don't, I wouldn't, wouldn't go so far to call it paradise. <laughs> it's had its problems and difficulties and it's hard to do this kind of remote work. But I, I think that the, the, just the sheer will of people all over the world, because we've heard that there's versions of COVID tracking project in dozens of countries, you know, not, not us specifically, but just other groups of people do who've, who've come to similar conclusions about what they need to do. You know, the mission happens to you and then you have to take it from there is the way I, I kind of see it. And I think that, um, people want to do this. People want to do good. You know, and another just literary reference here is, you know, there's an uh, uh, anarchist anthropologist named David Graeber who wrote an amazing feature in, in Harper's. It's actually got me into journalism called army of altruists. We basically pointed out like, you know, our economic system militates against people doing good for each other just to do it because that value gets captured by companies. And he posited at the time that, you know, that's one reason why a lot of people go into the military, even though it seems you know, um, certainly for people on the left, kind of counterintuitive that that altruistic people would go into the military. But, if, you know, I grew up in a rural poor place in Washington. Of course, all the kids I knew who were more in that mindset would go in the military and do that kind of stuff. And I and I see a kind of similar thread, like running through through those things, which is that like, you know, our society sometimes makes it hard to help, <laughs> you know. Uh, hard to do the right thing. Um, and, uh, and, and inside COVID tracking project, that was always what we wanted to do. We want to make it easy to do the right thing, you know? Yeah. So maybe the, the, the next direction is talking about what the government should be doing. And I, I think you're right to call out, like we are, it is fantastic to see science returning back up to the front leading from the front. But I think we also have to be honest that CDC has been atrophying over time. And it's been this long-term thing. And, and there's a surprising amount of fighting. All of this sits under Healthy Human Services, HHS. But you've got the National Institutes for Health. You've got Food and Drug Administration. You've got FEMA. FEMA. Yeah. You've got Asper. all these pieces. <laughs> yeah. and, and they didn't, they, there was turf. There's turf here that was very painful or is, is, is oftentimes still being really painful to see. Mm -hmm. And I would love for you, your response on like being in the intersection of those pieces. How do you think about it? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think that this was a live example of why federalism is so hard. Um, right. I mean, it's a really difficult task. Um, and then the federal government also has so many different components, right? I mean, just like the, the ones that you've been listing out. I do think that CDC should be the lead science agency. I mean, that seems pretty indisputable. The problem is like, are they really the emergency response agency? So like many, many people, at least growing up like me, I mean, I almost want to ask for if we were in, in the room, I'd be like, raise a hand, who read Hot Zone? You know, um, there's, you know, or, or, you know, people who know um, CDC from, from smallpox eradication, you know, um, elimination eradication. I'm not sure which one it is actually, but people know CDC from these heroic disease fighting roles or as disease detectives or these kinds of things. But over time, pieces of that emergency response role have actually been carved out of CDC. So what's left? They're, it's really scientists. And I think one of the really hard things is that people expected things from CDC to be this sort of like pandemic fighting force that actually they're not anymore. And I think CDC kind of expects of itself even that it is that. Um, and I think that creates problems. I think that the, the data needs to flow into like an interagency group within HHS, which is how the hospitalization data works, so that the different stakeholders that all need to use that information can use it in their own ways. One reason is that the standard that you have for publishing scientific papers and the time that it takes to get those things out is actually very different. And it's not pandemic time. <laughs> it right. takes you, a long you, time. You're trying to decide to shut down restaurants 
you don't have time for peer review. Exactly. So you need fast data there and you cannot, it's going to be less perfect. True. But you need uh, actionable data. And I think that is where the other stakeholders should say like, well, you know, maybe 90% of it is good enough. Let's go with that, you know? And I think it's really important to have those other stakeholders for future pandemics. Um, so I think that's, that's one big thing. And I do think you need to plow a bunch of money um, into not just CDC, really importantly, local and state health departments. They're the ones who need the help. If they get, if they're in good shape, then CDC will be fine. And I don't so think people appreciate this. And maybe I, I'm going to say just in a few minutes, we're going to go to audience Q and a, uh, so please get your questions in there. It is what is people don't realize like how this data actually flows. Could you just really briefly describe mm-hmm. the process of how, how data currently moves before it becomes supposed to be something the president. Or yeah, 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 yeah. Well, you know, you get a laboratory, uh, test, you know, you get a PCR test, um, that flows into some system, you know, if it's at a point of care, it might literally be a piece of paper, which someone then needs to, to enter into a system. If you, you know, are going to a lab core or whatever, it's probably electronic that goes into uh, county state and federal systems. But the way that that particular thing happens, the way that it gets into those systems can actually be quite different. And that's actually one of the trickiest things is that it's not actually a standard set of pipelines. Each state has its own arrangements and the feds actually have their own arrangements with some large laboratory test providers with hospitals. It's a little bit simpler. They're reporting in usually via hospital association, although sometimes they're reporting directly into one of two tools that the federal government has. But each of those things is even deaths. Deaths you think would be easy, right? Someone dies. Like it's, this is it. This is what the state does is know who is alive and who is dead. But actually there's a lot of complexity about the ways that states do death accounting. CDC itself does, does it multiple ways. And even filling out death certificates can introduce different complexities depending on who fills them out, how they fill them out, how they're instructed to fill them out. And all of that introduces like some variability um, into the data as well as differing time lags for the different states and methods of doing death accounting. So each and every metric that you could find, you know, for long-term care facilities and for um, racial uh, race and ethnicity data, all these problems exist, but like times 10. Um, So like even now, and and I just want to say the situation in Michigan right now is extremely concerning. Um, Cases are going up, hospitalizations are going up among all age groups. Um, And one reason is it Detroit is driving that. So we're seeing we're seeing cases going and and hospitalizations going up in Detroit, Philadelphia and Baltimore, three heavily black cities in which the vaccinate, the known vaccination rates of black residents of those places um, is much lower than the national average for for all races or for white people specifically. Um, And it's a really big problem. It doesn't it's not hesitancy. It's access. Is it like, you know, these are very small numbers still. But the problem is we don't know how bad the problem is because there's such large chunk of um, unknown uh, race vaccinations. So somebody gets vaccinated, but they didn't fill out the form with race. So we actually don't know how many black people in the city of Detroit, for example, have been vaccinated. We have a a minimum, but we don't know what the, the maximum is. And from what we're seeing right there with the data, it's extremely worrisome because if their rates are as low as they appear right now, um, that city has a lot of headroom to have a, a really quite bad outbreak, even with all of the, the great advances that have come from the vaccination. So, so these things are really, really quite important. Yeah. I'm so glad you called out the, the, the race aspect of this, the racial dimension of this, you know, especially as we're watching the, these questions arise over the summer. Uh, when, when we're having these, these very hard conversations that long overdue about racial tensions and, and, and inequity. And so, you know, like maybe the question, and, and we're just about to go in a few minutes to, to question. So please, as a reminder, sure, get sure. your questions in. And I'll go short. <laughs> it is, is what your, your chief data scientist for Biden, uh, what do you, what's your magic wand? What do you start putting in place to make sure we never have to deal with this issue again? What's our, what's our lessons learned moment here? 
Mm, oh man, it is. It's, it's actually really tough because I, I would, I mean, this is going to be so dumb and basic, but I would put a lot more resources into validating data coming from states and counties. Mm -hmm. So not just like the pipeline, but the sort of the feedback loop that exists between the sort of larger jurisdiction and the smaller jurisdictions, because there's just, you'd catch a lot more things and you'd build the relationship. Like you need the feedback loops running um, between, you know, counties and states and you need it running between states and the feds and you need all those people kind of tied together. So it's a, I, I, it's not the biggest thing in the world because, but it is an actionable thing. Like right now at CDC doing those, that validation, there's probably just a couple of people and in States, there's usually only a couple of people. Like when you talk about the data that's on the dashboard in South Dakota, it's one woman, right? So the, the, we're all of these numbers and all of the things that are driving these national responses, there's, literally probably 200 people. This is tractable, right? Like you could double the resources by putting 200 people out there. You know, I mean, it's, it's, that's what's I think so wild to us. We realize oftentimes that COVID tracking project had substantially more people working on something than, than the total government um, on, on particular issues. Like that's bonkers. And um, yeah, I'll just leave it there. That's just crazy. Well, and it should have never been that way. Yeah. What, one of the things I think that's in there is, you know, to data scientists and all the people that are out there who want to work on COVID related issues or other things, what's your advice to them? Go to U.S. Digital Response. Um, go like go, go in there. Um, I think that lots of people and we saw this. So many people thought that they could go on you know, create something on the outside and make it great. And, and there's, and there's, you know, been some great things, COVID X strategy and COVID act now. And there've been people on the outside who, um, you know, to, to varying degrees have been able to have a really, you know, nice impact in, in some places, but man, like it's, it's wild to see those efforts develop when we know how under-resourced and understaffed it is on the inside. Um, and, you know, the, the latest example is take a look at like the vaccine uh, websites and stuff, right? I mean, uh, take a look at the reporting for antigen tests, most of which isn't getting done in part because there was no, no one thought of it, basically. I mean, there's, you know, there's all these people just fighting for scraps out there, you know, in so many areas of the tech world. Meanwhile, there's this incredible service you could do to your country, live off your Bitcoin for a while and like do this thing, you know? I mean, there's just so, so yeah. much need and build, you get to build something that, that is meaningful and for the, the long term as well. Right. You know, it's, it's something that got told to me very early on in public service. Secretary, Ash, uh, Secretary of Defense Ash Carter said this is the stories that you tell later in life are of those moments of service. Those, mm -hmm. those very tough moments where you made the sacrifice to do something greater. And, and I'm glad you're calling out the, the U.S. digital response for those that don't know it and all volunteer network. There's a, uh, a session here at the Commonwealth Club. You can go look it up on the YouTube or the archives. I'm actually interviewing where I'm interviewing Rayleigh Young and uh, mm -hmm. Jennifer Polka, two of the creators of it, uh, uh, Ryan Pachavram, Corey Zarek, a number of others, just all phenomenal people on this team. There's also U.S. Digital Service, and there's many career roles also there. 18F, right. 18F, yeah. all these places that there are viable places. Maybe that, that the, the, the first question that, that we'll, we'll turn to is, you know, this, this, this one of all the, the, the other, the project is not, is, is, is kind of going to that phase of stasis is what are the goals and efforts that you're seeing where people are now starting to do the real research and analyzing the numbers and trying to kind of look back and do that lessons learned of mm -hmm. what actually happened? Where, yeah. Was it the big spring, spring break moment? Where, where did we, where did we lose control of this? Yeah. I mean, we're doing some of that work, uh, what we call this, what we're calling this phase is the accountability phase, um, you know, where we're digging in on like, what, 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 what did happen? Where did the, the response go wrong? I mean, we're obviously focused on the data, but of course the data is tied in with all these, these other things as well. Um, you know, there's different commissions forming. Um, there's one that's in the planning stage, uh, with the, the director of the nine 11 commission. Um, 
I think, you know, the office of inspector general at HHS is, uh, is on a few different things. There's, there's going to be a lot of that kind of, uh, para governmental and, and internal government, you know, kind of thinking, um, there's, uh, here, here's the thing about doing the research on this, on this data, it's going to be really tough because particularly in the early days, it's so messy, so messy. I mean, you figure, figure that we missed 90% of the cases in the, in the spring, we can't get that back. We don't really know. Um, and now, even if you were to go do, you know, what's called like a sero prevalence survey, right? Like find out, test people for antibodies, do some statistical magic. And you say like, okay, this many, there's about this many people were infected in this place. Um, now there's been so many different surges and waves. It's not like you could ever go back and recover what it was actually like in the springtime. I mean, they did some limited um, surveying. You may be able to figure out some stuff from different variant lin lineages or whatever, but there's some things that have just been lost to the, to the fog. Um, there's a great group, if you're interested in looking at it, at uh, Carnegie Mellon uh, called Delphi. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about them is they have all this data, but they also have it like as of. So you can go, you know, they can improve the data through time, but you can also go back and look at like, well, what did we know on April 14th um, from these different metrics? So there's, a, there's different groups. I think one, one thing I expect to see is that the foundations will lead a lot of this in the early days funding things, trying to get it made official in Congress or in some other way. But I mean, clearly we need to have a huge reckoning. I mean, you know, it, yeah, I think it's, of, it's important to call out, like, as you said, it's like these data points have names, right? It's very easy to see this thing and say, look, there's 560,000 dead. Yeah. Those are real people. Those are yeah. real lives. Those are real stories that, that, that have been lost and, exactly. and they're deserve, they deserve, they deserve a reckoning. They deserve 100%. a hearing of, yeah. of, of where, what we did. Right? And we owe it to our, our kids. And our yes. Kids. yes. And I, you know, I mean, it's going to come down to whether like the Republicans in Congress want to want to do this. Um, and they should, I mean, the truth is they, they should, because at least from my perspective, we want to blame everything on the Trump administration. You know, it's actually easier for everyone to imagine that that's what happened because it's actually less scary then that our technocratic systems failed also. But that's what happened. Our technocratic systems also failed. And some of that is Trump administration's fault. But I mean, let me tell you, we should have a wastewater surveillance dashboard up. They, totally. it, they, they got funding to do it in the summertime. They told me in October it'd be ready by the end of the year, which, by the way, that's also nuts. And here we are. You know, it's March 24th. We don't have there. it. There's no dashboard. So like, We're still what the hell? tracking the variants. Yeah. Well, where was our variant tracking? Exactly. Didn't do it. You right. know, um, there's just so, 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 and, and, you know, we heard CS, the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists is a group that works really closely with CDC. And they have been saying since, you know, April, they didn't even want to track cases. And I felt like that was, it's indicative of an attitude inside CDC, which is basically like, listen, we'll do what we do. We, we're the experts. You, we'll just tell you what to do. You just stay at home. You just do this. You do this, do that. And I feel like we talked about those systems, the plumbing systems that had never been tested. Well, a lot of their communication strategies hadn't been tested either because no one's been through a pandemic like this. And if there's one thing we know for sure, it was that people expected data um, in order to make the sacrifices that they were making. And the second that that was apparent, which should have been apparent before, but the second it was apparent in, like, in the beginning of the pandemic, they needed to adopt new communication strategies and new styles, more like Fauci, even more like Dr. Burks, who lots of people don't like, but I think is fine. And, you know, they needed to adopt that strategy and, and still didn't. So anyway, there's a reckoning coming so, and I, the sooner the better. Let's, let's look forward also on the, the pandemic. That's, you know, my view, we're still at, we're barely at halftime. Yeah. I think a lot yeah, of people yeah. think it's like the, 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 the final two minutes uh, mm -hmm. drill, but I, I, I still feel like we got a long way ahead of us. What feel free to challenge that. Like what's your crystal ball is, mm -hmm. is uh, um, the question that is coming in. And like, what do the numbers tell you right now? Like, as you said about Detroit yeah. and these other cities, what, what, yeah. what, what, what do you see happening? I, I think we're, you know, I don't know if it's a variant or something else, but I think we're about to see another flare up. And I think what, what my, my crystal ball, if I listen, we don't make actual official predictions within CTP. So this is just Alexis Madrigal talking here. Uh, don't listen to him. Um, but here's, here's what I'm seeing that under resourced areas in which vaccination rates are much lower 
particularly places that were hit in the springtime, but not as hard in the summer or, or in the winter, may be in for trouble again. And that's what the preliminary signs look like to me. I think that a few weeks ago, we started saying that people were underweight the scenario that we just plateau much higher than we wanted to. And that looks like what is happening. We just kind of are plateauing at a level that's like way higher than, than you would want. Um, and I think that what it portends is probably that a, in a lot of areas will be fine from here on out. I think where really high vaccination rates and, you know, uh, large numbers of pre-existing infections, but that there are going to be pockets that still get just crushed. Like right now, if you looked at admissions um, at Temple University Hospital um, in North Philadelphia, where I actually worked for a summer uh, in college, um, they, you know, they're back up to probably 80 percent of their peak from over over the wintertime, you know, and I, I think. There's been a way in which we've we've yo-yoed between the pandemic being something that affects lots of, you know, everyone and that affects, um, you know, uh, under resource groups. And I think we're heading back into a scary moment where there's a bunch of people who are going to be like, well, I don't care. I'm vaccinated. And yet groups that don't have that access uh, are going to be in trouble. It, it's an incredible social reckoning of, of uh, almost our... It's our <laughs> It's just this it's amazing hard view in the mirror of our society where people are not willing to take the responsibility of their actions that may impact others because they may be asymptomatic or or other things. And I, I'm you know, this is another question, which is, is like of all this this year, this insanity of this year, what's the one lesson or piece of advice that you've learned that you would that you would wish everyone would know? Oh, um, you know, uh, I think it, 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 this one's actually a, an interesting slash weird one. It's that immunity is not off on, right? People think of it as a switch, but you know, my amazing colleague, uh, at the Atlantic, Sarah Zhang, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's, it's a, it's a slider. And I think that people really want, and that's true at the individual level, it's true at the societal level that like people want it to be like, well, am I immune or not? You know, it's such a dumb movie version of it. You know, it's like Matt Damon and Contagion, like, well, I just couldn't get it. You know, it's, it's not like that. And I think that um, if people really could understand that, it would help them think about the risk to society and to themselves if they've been previously infected or if they've been vaccinated. And I actually think it might make people feel more comfortable doing things that are, you know, low, low risk, but social being outside with people, go on a hike with people, you know, I mean, there's a, there's, there's ways in which we can deepen our thinking about immunity and about risk that I, I think would have made this time a little bit easier for people to deal with and made people less absolute in one direction, like going to just never leave the house or absolute in the other direction, which was socially catastrophic. If there's like one lesson that I wish everyone knew off this is like, if, if people could really get a better understanding of conditional probabilities <laughs> and that, that like, what does 95% mean? Mm -hmm. What is it like? It, it, yeah. It's like the compounding impact of these decisions really is very stunning. Yeah. Another person asked, you know, is there uh, is there a modern equivalent of paradise born in hell uh, um, for online teams or helpers? If not, why not write it, Alexis? <laughs> I, I, you know, honestly, like what I really hope comes out of a uh, COVID tracking project is a collective project to do the sort of storytelling around what, what happened. Um, you know, we have two great team members, Kara Oler uh, and artist Kariskis, who right now are actually like raising some money to try and do a podcast uh, about COVID tracking project that would allow us to bring everybody's voices for the project. Because it's true. Like, I've written books. I could write book. Um, but I think the true like embodiment of like what we've done would be a podcast that brings together, you know, dozens of people from the project and allows them to tell the story of this, of this community. I, I think if there's one takeaway that I'm hearing from you is this, this is, this is community. And it's been this amazing thing is that I think these, it's a reminder what carries us through these tough times. Oh. Isn't, government or these other things it's the actions we take as individuals and those that bring us together as, as community organizers. Yeah. And so, you know, as there's people out there also who are trying to figure out how do you, how do you be a community organizer? What, 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 like, what's your advice to them to, to, to create 
this thing. This is almost like you, you as a founder, what, 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 yeah. what is that moment that allows you to be that founder? Uh, I, don't, I, I mean, I think the, the basics of it are you got to care about the people that you're working with, you know, they're not a, they, that, that, that was it for me. I mean, I, I think that's all that I would really say. I would watch these people just working so hard and I would just be like, God damn, I know that that person has like, is a single mom and has like a kid at home and is doing this stuff. I know that that person like is working a full job and then they're coming in the, in the evening and they're putting in all this work and that person's doing this and that person's doing that. And I, I just, the respect for the personal sacrifices and, and skills and abilities of, of people. Um, I think when that was really it. And, and I, here's another thing that I would say that I think is the true, like maybe secret magic of the project is I think we built a place on the internet where it was a good place to be a woman. Like over time, our project became more and more women in the project, it's probably 80% now. Um, and I think that one reason is that it just was a space where, you know, jerky guys were immediately bounced, you know, like we moderated hard. And I think that, um, you know, I, I feel like I've learned a ton about like, oh man, wow. Like you unleash the power of, of women in leadership roles and running the show and, and you make sure that it's like a safe space where like people aren't doing or saying creepy things. And like, boy, like it just, it was like magnetized all these like brilliant um, women to come into the, to the project. And that really, I mean, I think that was really it. Like if, if it truly, if, if we had not done that, I think the project would have fallen apart. And I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of other projects that were much more bro did in fact fall apart for exactly well, those reasons. I think it's such a great, great, great place to end. Cause there's, there's so much more we can get into, but before we kind of close out, there's a tradition here. We ask all of our speakers, which is the following question. What is your 60 second idea, Alexis, to change the world? I mean, I think I kind of have to answer this because of COVID tracking project that I would say, what if people conceptualized, you know, what they wanted to do in the world, like the thing they wanted to produce wasn't something that they sort of they themselves personally would create. But what if it, what if people thought about it as well, what is the community that I would build that would have the productive capacity to do this thing. Um, because I could have never done this on my own. Aaron could have never done this on her own, Rob, Jeff, nobody. It required this large community of supporters of people inside the project that health departments and foundations and all these things. And I just feel like it allows you to sort of create a, a, a better kind of ambition. If you think like, well, what is the community that we would need? What are the tools? And then now we can actually go after this mission. It's fantastic. Well, uh, Alexis, I want to thank you for joining me here today at Inforum and the Commonwealth Club. And, and I just also want to say, just on behalf of being a citizen and member of the society and also a data scientist, I just want to say thank you to you and the rest of the COVID tracking project team, the backers, everybody else with, with just incredible gratitude because, uh, you filled a gap that that is essential. And I fundamentally believe you saved you and the team saved an incredible number of lives. So thank you for, for what you've done. And I will the, pass it along. Team. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And, and to everybody else, you know, I hope you'll consider getting involved in many different ways in your community. There's so much to do so much to be. And one of the things that you can do is also continue to join in here at the Commonwealth club. If you'd like to watch more virtual programs or support the Commonwealth clubs efforts in making virtual programming, please visit Commonwealth club dots org slash online. I'm DJ Patil. Thank you. And please stay safe. <laughs>